Thank you. So, hi, I'm Eric, and uh, I'm going to be talking to you today, today about the Grails plugin ecosystem and kind of venturing outside of the Grails plugin ecosystem to find a few things you may or may not know about and give you a whole bunch of code examples and kind of show you what's out there. So, it's kind of, I don't know if you know Stephen Colbert, he used to have Better Know a District uh, on his TV show, so this is kind of in that flavor of just rapidly going through and uh, looking at a whole bunch of different plugins. So who, who am I? You can reach me at Eric Helgeson or Null Eric on Twitter. Uh, my day job is I do uh, Grails consulting at Agile Orbit, a small consulting company in the U.S. Uh, work on Grails day to day. I also have a small side business for preschools and daycares, Sprouty.com, all written in uh, Grails. I'm the author of Practical Grails 3. If you don't have it, you should. Uh, Great Conf will be giving out a couple of free copies here today or this week, so be on the lookout for that. And lastly, I was the Grails rock star last year, so I was humbled that OCI gave me that honor, but they're doing it again this year, so if you'd like to nominate someone in the community that helps you out or um, is just really active outside the OCI Grails team, uh, you can nominate them right there. Uh, and join the Groovy and Grails Slack. I'm active on there. You can ask me questions or just chat about Groovy and Grails things. So what's this talk about? So show of hands, who's on Grails 3 right now? So most, that's good. Grails 2? Yeah, some same people in Grails 1? One person? Or no. <laughs> well, that's good. Most people on Grails 3 by now, I think th that... Early on, some of the plugins was holding people back from migrating to Grails 3, but now it's, you know we're three years in, I think, on Grails 3, and that's not really an issue anymore. So like I said, we're going to look at some plugins. And so plugins are what I think make Grails great. It's someone's packaged together some good, sane defaults for doing something, and you get to use that. Um, it gets you going quickly, and that's why we use Grails. I don't want... From my perspective, I want to spend time shipping features and not configuring beans and build or you know wiring up stuff. I'd rather someone else figure out 90% of it and I figure out the rest um, and build on what other people have already done. So in Grails 3, as you know, it's a little less magic but a lot more standard. So things like I mentioned, Grails 2 to Grails 3, people had some confusion about. Uh, what was going on, because uh, there's a new build system built on top of Spring Boot, but all those things give us, as Grails developers, a lot more to work with. And that's what we'll be going over. Uh, to venture outside the Grails ecosystem, like Gradle and Spring Boot. So I did mention that. So, as you know, Grails moved to, uh, now they're just jars. Grails plugins are just dependencies in your build.gradle instead of zips. It's a lot easier to distribute. They're not on a custom distribution anymore. They're just on Bintray. Um, and Gradle opens up a lot more functionality than the custom ant build system we had before. And like I said, we're built on top of Spring Boot. That opens up a lot more. And yeah, I think some of the, I'm going to skip this because we're all on Grails 3. So I wrote this with Grails 2 users in mind as well, but we'll focus more on Grails 3 or what it is today. So we uh, actually, uh, Bobby Warner, Matt Sheehan, and myself built the initial Grails 3 portal. And uh, because there wasn't a Grails 3 portal to begin with, um, OCI has taken that, revamped it, added their light orange theme into it now instead of green. I still like the green. <laughs> um, but there's new issues that we didn't run into bef before with Grails 2 because uh, there's binary incompatibilities if or package names change, uh, different versions of Spring Boot or Grails. Um, your plugin won't work because it's not, it wasn't compiled with your app anymore. These issues, they're, while they're out there, they're few and far between, and usually people fix them right away. All right, so let's dive into code examples and what we have out there. So most apps that I've worked with need scheduling, so we want to schedule a, ta a job to do something. And actually, since we're built on top of Spring Boot, we already have the scheduled annotation, and we just get that for free because Grails is based on Spring Boot. Uh, it's easy, great for simple scheduling if you don't have a lot of requirements about um, when and how you should schedule. Uh, good things are like health check, you know, maybe you want to clear your system cache every day at midnight, or things like that. 
So let's look at how we can use it. So it's very easy, right? We have the scheduled annotation from the Spring Framework, and uh, it gives you a few different ways to schedule it. So this one's just a really simple um, check here that makes sure our health or we have 100 kilobytes of disk space free on our root partition. And we can see that every five seconds, uh, just make sure it's good. You can also do some basic cron in here as well, and or a fixed delay. You can see that after five seconds, your app runs, and you get a little message here in a second, all good. So really, I mean, if you don't need a lot of requirements around scheduling, it's a good option to schedule some basic tasks. But maybe you have some more advanced scheduling. So Quartz is the enterprise scheduler, as it's called. It's kind of the de facto scheduler if you need some more advanced options. Um, and Grails, Grails has a Quartz plugin that creates a custom artifact, which ends in job, and they're in the Grails app slash jobs directory. Um, you can schedule almost anything you need and handle errors and do a lot of more advanced things. There's a few rough edges on the Grails 3 one. Um, by default, it started, and then someone made a patch and then stopped. Didn't start by default, and then it did again. There's kind of some odd things there. Uh, since it's a custom artifact, the trans transaction propagation handle was handled a little differently, so it doesn't work exactly the same as it does in the service. I have an issue open for that. Um, and then the IDE, IDE integration sometimes doesn't work exactly right, but it's easy if you just mark it as source. So let's take a look at that. This is many of you have probably used Quartz, so uh, one. So we can see that we have a Quartz custom artifact here. Have a couple jobs. Triggers aren't required. You don't need to uh, have a trigger. So maybe you want to do some processing asynchronously and you don't really have a way to do that in your app. Maybe you don't have a message queue or something like that. You can actually do asynchronous handling, specify no triggers. And on your registration, uh, you want to send an email. Uh, you can do that asynchronously as w if you'd like. So uh, all the jobs have a trigger now static method and you can pass in your job parameters there. So that's just kind of one. If you have quartz already in your project, it's a nice additional thing that a lot of people aren't aware of. Um, and then we can implement the same type of health check. You can see that we have triggers here again with uh, it running. So that's kind of just a quick overview of the quartz plugin. And of course, there is the Schwartz plugin as well, which is built by my employer, Agile Orbit. So it's also built on quartz, but it takes a different approach. It uses traits instead of um, custom artifacts. And it gives you a lot more uh, cleaner ability to kind of see into what the job is doing and where or how it's doing it. Um, you just extend a service with the quor or quartz job trait, and you can just use a regular service. Uh, it's very well documented. Uh, dem generates the database migration changelog for you if you use uh, persistent scheduling. And it's really just kind of meant to give you a lot of helpers to the Quartz project without getting in the way. So let's take a look at Schwartz. So it's kind of the same thing here we have, but we see I just have a package named Schwartz. It doesn't need to be named that. But we have the same uh, implementation as we had before, just very simple. It implements the Schwartz job, which we click into. We can see it's just a trait and gives you, you can, the documentation's right here. You can see all the things you have access to, the triggers, how the trigger works. Oh, I forgot to mention there's a lot of builder and helpers around uh, using the builder type pattern in this as well. Um, so let's look at this one as well. Uh, it takes a list of triggers, so you, it has the builder um, functionality on building triggers as well. So you can see we have an interval, and the nice thing about this is it's all autocompletes. So, you know, got day end and daily, and so you can kind of really quickly build up your triggers with the requirements you need. Um, you can see another example here at hour 12, at minute 30 of the first day of the month, build it. Or you can just give it a cron expression as well. And just like the trigger now, we have a trigger job, which is just a, you inject the service like you would any other Grail service, and you can trigger the job and give it a map of parameters as well, just like the Quartz 
plugin. So yeah, that's just an alternative to Quartz, a little different approach with traits and builder helpers built in. So if you're running Quartz, um, you can run it in a cluster, and if you have more than one machine, uh, you should. Uh, you can back your jobs by a database, so if you have an issue, you, uh, a failed job, or um, you, know, you want to pause your schedule and restart your app, you can do those type of things as well with a back store, or JDBC back store. Uh, one tip is that you, schedulers are node specific, so if you want to shut down your whole cluster, you have to stop all the nodes individually. Um, I'm sure each node has a unique ID, and that's actually solved by auto. It'll automatically do that and give you a unique ID. And like I mentioned, it can be an easy way to do some async work if you don't have any other um, tools in your tool belt to do that. Uh, Jesqueue is another scheduling uh, option you have. It's similar to Ruby's Rescue. Uh, it uses Redis uh, queues to store the job and then execute them. It processes jobs as they come in. Uh, it uses the same st uh, s structure as the Quartz uh, plugin does, so it has the same job artifact. And again, it processes works as it comes in. Uh, there's a Quartz admin and JSQ admin. I think they're not well maintained right now, um, but they do give you an interface in to kind of see what's going on in your queues or in your jobs uh, and do some basic administrative tasks. All right, so that's scheduling. So we have a, you know, three or four options there for scheduling. Um, you know, pick one that suits your needs. Uh, the plugin's there. It's done most of the work for you. All right, so let's look at security and specifically start with Spring Security. Uh, Spring Security Core, I think we all know and love because it does most of the security work for us. Gives us all the power of Spring Security with the same defaults to get started. And of course, you know, it has an S2 quick start to get all your domain classes up and running. Uh, recent, some recent improvements that have been a part of is that it uses lower bcrypt rounds in tests. So in testing, uh, you don't need to use you know a thousand or ten thousand rounds of uh, bcrypt because it's slower and it's meant to be slower but in a test you don't need to do that so it can speed up your tests if you um, encode passwords uh, and you can set that as well um, a simple one we added in recently was to ignore case for the username so a capital E in your email doesn't uh, d isn't a different user than a lowercase e if your data store is case sensitive which most are and that really lowers the need for a custom user detail service because we've found a lot of people are just implementing a custom user detail service just to have um, case insensitive lookups. And if you're using later versions of Grails 3, uh, they remove dependency injection, so the password encoder is now an event listener when you generate your app. Of course, you have tag libs for security and doing things in GSP, user switching. And one thing to note, I recently implemented user switching. It doesn't have to be an administrator user that can use user switch. You can actually implement your own user switching interface to allow maybe an uh, administrator, or if you have multiple clients and they have users under them, you can allow them to switch to their own uh, users as well. So it's kind of nice if you have a, like a sub-administrator, a global administrator, which is yourself, and then maybe clients have administrators of their certain aspects of the application. Uh, with Spring Security, there's lots of sub-projects which give you a lot more functionality. So Spring Security REST defaults to stateless JWT tokens. Um, you can encode and encrypt them. They're stateless, so they are stored on the client side usually if they're stateless. Or you can actually store them in a storage such as your database Redis or Memcache to look up your user properties. And that's a, a common, commonly used for REST endpoints if you want to use uh, some security. Uh, Spring Security UI, while it does work on Grails 3, there hasn't been a lot of new development on it. Um, it provides some nice things like registration, password resets, and things like that, but I find myself just kind of uh, implementing those myself because, because a lot of times there's some custom requirements on how that should look or how that, sh how that flow should work. So I kind of look at that as uh, there's some examples of how it could work, and then I implement my own. Uh, and of course, if you're in an enterprise, there's tons of enterprise um, plugins for that, LDAP, CAS, and all those other major enterprise-y type authentication systems. Uh, so let's go. Spring Security. So here's uh, the example of that uh, password uh, or the abstract event listener. So you can see that 
uh, before a user object is updated or inserted, it will encode the password. So this, if you're not if you're not in Grails 3.3 yet and disabled dependency injection in your domain classes, which you should because you save about half the amount of memory um, in your Grails app, uh, this is kind of a new way to do it. Uh, what was I going to show here? Oh, and then uh, one of the other things too is that Spring Security Service has this current user, and it was deprecated, but I think they took the deprecation back off of it. Uh, one thing you should always know if you have a high volume uh, application is that this actually does call the data database to load the user. So if you, you you're adding just an extra database call every time you call that uh, get current user, and alternatively you should just load the properties you need on the the principal so that that's in the session. You don't have to go all the way to the database to get that. I think that's all I'm going to talk about on um, Spring Security. So there are other options out there. Shiro um, is out there for some ACL work. And uh, there's a Enforcer plugin which simplifies the Spring Security ACL because it's kind of cumbersome to build those ACLs in Spring Security just raw. So the Enforcer plugin can help you do that. Session management. So Pro Security is managing that session. And one of the best things I think you can do for an app, if you haven't already, is move that session out of your container. So if it's in Tomcat right now or Jetty or whatever you're using, is move that out. Because then it really opens up the door for blue-green deploys. It opens up um, even just if you have to reset your app, Spring Loaded didn't. Oh, let's just went out. <laughs> Spring Loaded didn't. Uh, load your application right and you want to restart your app, you're not logged out every time that happens. So uh, it's very nice for that. So Spring Session is out there. It allows you to use multiple data stores, such as Redis, JDBC. Um, and the thing to note about that is that sessions in Spring Session are immutable by de default, so you can't mutate them after they're set for performance reasons. Because if you had a cluster of a 1,000 servers and you know hundreds of thousands of users on there, you wouldn't want all that traffic going back and forth uh, writing and updating sessions. Um, and there are some API differences from Spring Session to Spring Security, which I've had to write a couple custom adapters um, to, to do or to make use of in Spring Security. And I think the next version out of Spring Session addresses many of those incompatibilities, but I, there's still a few out there. So there is a Spring Session plugin out there on the plugin, Rails 3 plugin portal, and it works out of the box, and it's great. But do we really need that? Do we need a plugin for this? Maybe, maybe not. So I'm going to show you kind of, oops, that's Spring Security again, sorry. So if we look at the build Gradle file here, since again, we're built on top of uh, Spring Boot, there's a Spring Starter Redis, and then a Spring Session dependency. And Spring Boot will automatically configure your sessions um, based on that. So just adding these two dependencies to your build.gradle, you'll have uh, Redis session management. And I did mention that those sessions were immutable, but sometimes, like for Flash, if your app uses Flash scope, you may want it mutable. Um, and this, I just pulled this right out of the uh, plugin on uh, the Grails 3 plugin portal. And this is the only thing you need is a request filter. And if the session has a Flash scope on it, uh, allow it to be mutated. So just with a couple lines of build Gradle, and if you need this uh, session synchronizer, uh, you can add that as well. And you have uh, sessions offloaded off your container, which is quite handy. All right. There's also a cookie session plugin, just to round it all out. Uh, it stores, it serializes and stores everything on the cookie. So again, you're not um, storing that in your session in your container. It can add quite a lot of bulk to your request if you have quite a bit in your user object. Um, so just be aware of that. There's a limit on the size of cookies, and you might not want all that traffic going back and forth. All right, so talked about security, talked about um, session management, and let's talk about some database plugins that help you out. And one of the awesome things about Grails is that we have GORM, and GORM knows the data model of your application, so it's the database migration plugin ties into that. It generates the database schema for you. 
um, by inspecting your domain classes. And I'll say it takes an educated guess at what to do. It's not always right. Um, so you always have to review your changes that your database change log generates uh, just for the one simple reason. It doesn't know how you access your data. So if you're accessing um, a column that isn't indexed, it doesn't know that, and it won't create the index for you. You'll have to do that. So it uses Liquibase for that. Uh, there's another one, uh, which, depending on your deployment scenario, might suit you, which is Flyway. Um, it's different. It doesn't inspect and generate the scripts. It uses version SQL scripts instead. So you write the SQL to alter your tables and do your things, and this might fit well if you work with DBAs and they kind of control the database side, but you also want to version your uh, your alter tables and all those fun things. You can also run it standalone. You don't have to run it inside your Grails app when it starts up. Um, so yeah, so let's look at a couple examples of database migration and Flyway. So database migration has a DVM GORM diff, which will generate a diff. So if we look at, we have a really simple uh, data model in this example. We have a person with a couple properties. And you can see I'm using the Java 8 local date here. And an address just with a couple things here as well. If we look at the change log that was generated, you can see that, I'll make it a little bigger, that we have some, you know, just the appropriate change log for our tables. But if we look down here at the birthday, you can see it, it's storing it as a far binary instead of a, a date or a date time. And that's, again, one of the reasons to review your change log is that I didn't have the hibernate um, dialect for Java time on my class path, so I didn't know that it could store it in a more efficient way. So if you start as a binary, it's going to be hard to query. And as, after you get a few hundred thousand records in there, you'll probably notice some performance different, or some bad performance. So yeah, again, just gen review your change log and go there. So let's look at Flyway. Flyway does have a, a plugin as well. Um, hasn't been updated in a while and it has, uh, Flyway has a Spring Boot starter as well so you might as well just use that. So just take advantage of that we're built on top of Spring Boot. So the, this is your application YAML. It's just taking these Spring Boot properties. We enable it. We tell it where to find the, the scripts. Uh, and how our scripts are prefix prefixed and suffixed. And see, I mean, I just created a little example here because I didn't write, want to write a whole bunch of SQL, but you can just enter in raw SQL here for your database. Another thing to note, too, is that this is, you're writing this SQL, so it can be um, vendor specific. Uh, the database migration will honor your, uh, your vendor as well, so, but you might need. So if you're on Postgres and use some Postgres-specific features, you'll need to be aware of that, because those, those won't run on MySQL, for example. And that's really all you need to do to have Flyway running, is add that and then add the Flyway. Oh, I, I, I guess I actually am using the Flyway plugin here. But it works very similar if you just use a Spring Boot starter. All right, database logging. So We've all kind of used this one before, is just log SQL true. That's helpful. It, it spits out the Hibernate uh, parameters, and you, know, you can get an idea of what's going on in your database, um, which is useful. There's also a Hibernate stats, which um, on the Hibernate session, you can print out some stats. I've done that many times to see how many times I'm flushing the session or opening a transaction. Uh, and lastly, there's the P6 spy, which is a more JDBC centric um, kind of intercepts the driver at the driver level so you can print out the actual raw SQL that's going to your database which in my opinion is the most useful because you can just copy and paste those out and see where and what's going wrong uh, I just talked about that yep okay so the, the bean is hibernate stats so if you want to add that uh, to maybe an interceptor of your all your controllers or maybe in a in your services you can add that as well so really, it was, it's good to know if you're running one query or you know n plus one queries uh, to get all that data back into your application. So let's look at the logging database. 
Oop, I didn't open that one. Uh, database. Login. All right, so you can see that it kind of uses this JDBC namespace here for the P6 spy. And I think if I run this, it'll, we'll just, yeah, we'll see the raw SQL coming out uh, when Bootstrap runs. I'm doing a few things in Bootstrap. You do have to add a few properties or to your log logging config to make sure that the, the appropriate log level is set. Uh, so the, those P6 spy. So here you can see that it actually created the table person. And so you could copy this right in. It's using an H2 database right now. But you can just copy and paste that into your H2 console, and it would run. So again, kind of nice. Here's the, and here's the comparison, right? It, here's the Hibernate one, which you don't see the values. And here's the P6 by one. And this, sorry, it's kind of small. Can't make the console bigger. But you can see it inserts values, null, zero, and foo. So again, and it shows you just more stuff about it. So very useful. Don't want to leave it on in production, but useful for development to see what SQL is going on with your application. Dialects. I mentioned dialects earlier. So dialects really allow, tell Hibernate how to store something in your database. Um, there's a Postgres, Postgres SQL extensions, and they help a lot with um, native sequencing, native types like JSONB. Um, and again, it, you can add one in there for the Java time uh, serialization as well. And you can also create your own. They're not too difficult. There's a lot of good examples um, out there. So let's look quick at some dialects and how they work. So we have an example here of a person. Let's look at this person quick. This person has a name, birthday, and a map of their preferences. And this map is just a JSONB da data type. And that comes from the, the plugin. And we can see that it tells it what type it is, the SQL type, for the JSONB structure. So if we look at Bootstrap here, we can see that I give it a name, a local date for the birthday. And then in my preferences, I just have a map. It could be you know, just that map is serialized to JSON. So you can see I have notify, phone, true, email, true, and just their notification preferences. It also enhances the criteria query, so you can you can use this function on the criteria query, which is PG JSON contains. So we look at the preferences and give it a map of what we want to query on. So it'll natively query that JSON structure uh, in Postgres. So if we let's actually just take a look at the database structure here. So describe person. Oh, I'm gonna run it. we'll see that this is stored natively as JSON. There we go. So you can see the type is native JSONB, and the birth date is a date and not a binary, like it was in our previous example. And let's just select star from person. Oops, that was on. Uh, and you can see it's stored natively as JSON. So we can use the uh, Postgres native uh, queries to query that, or the enhanced uh, criteria queries to query that data structure. All right. All right, one of the nice new things that uh, was added to GORM was multi-tenancy. Uh, it's not a plugin, it's just built into GORM, but it, it allows you to segregate your data by tenant uh, by a different aspect, so you can do it by a schema or by identifier, so I'd, like an ID on the column, a tenant ID on the column, or you can have actual separate databases. Um, like I said, built recently into GORM, and it allows you to really quickly spin up a SaaS solution. So if you have multiple tenants and they have multiple users in there, it allows you to quickly bring up a solution like that and make sure every each user's data is se segregated from the other user. There's some great guides out there on great guides like rails.org for implementing some custom tenant resolvers, database per tenant, and um, dynamic data sources based on multi-tenancy. 
So let's look at an example of that. So I just actually grabbed the multi-tenant example from the, um, the guide and just going to show that. So you can, in your domain classes, what you do is actually just, so this engine implements multi-tenant and the class, which is multi-tenant. And that's really all you have to do. Now all your um, finders, when you run it in a, in a way that, or with a current tenant, you'll actually uh, only query those engines that are of that tenants. Then you can put that on any object, and you can have objects that maybe aren't multi-tenant as well. And you can implement your own um, tenant resolver if you'd like to as well. So one of the things, if you're running a unit test, you won't, sometimes you won't have a web request going on, so you'll need to set the tenant yourself. So one of the ways to do that is to implement a tenant resolver. And this one's a system property tenant resolver. And actually, in our test, we had to override this one and make it a string property because for some reason, or we, we statically set a string property instead of um, uh, reading in a string property. So it gives you a way to uh, implement and customize how your tenants are resolved if they're resolved in a web request or outside of a web request, such as in a test. Um, and one thing to note is that there is some more configuration that needs to be done when you're testing. Um, you do need to either do it in an integration test or a Hibernate spec, because you do need a real data source. Um, this one took me a long time to figure out, actually, is that you needed to, this is how you get the, or set the configuration for the Hibernate spec to, like, set the, a different property resolver um, and things like that. So again, look at the guides. There's tons of great guides out there for multi-tenancy. And it's a real, once you kind of get the concepts of it, it allows you to kind of iterate really quickly on multi-tenant or building multi-tenant solutions. So in the database realm, there's some honorable mentions here as well. The audit logging plugin, which is great for having uh, an audit log of every change made on a domain class and who made that change. Um, the new cache for plugin, which is um, kind of a rewrite of the old cache plugin. Uh, they just released a new soft delete plugin as well, which is, which is implemented very nicely, so you can allow users to delete data without actually deleting it, um, and two Hibernate searches in there for some reason. Just one, actually, the Hibernate search allows you to kind of do full text search. I don't have examples of that, but just some other area plugins where you can help with database. All right, so email. We have the old and tried and trusted Grails mail plugin. Simpy, simple, easy to use, has some asynchronous uh, capabilities built in, so you can get that sending an email off the main thread and keep going. But there's also some others out there as well. So Spring Boot starter mail, it's quite low level. I tried to kind of configure it and make it work. There's an example of it on that site. I thought it was just a little too low level um, on what I wanted to set up. But there's someone made a Spring Boot email tools plugin, or uh, starter, which is, provides a lot of really nice capabilities if you're doing anything beyond the simple email, uh, emailing your users. F you can use multiple template engines. Um, it allows you to schedule emails and set priority to those emails. So that's kind of nice. If your user registration wants to go out first, if, even if you have a bulk queue of you know, 10,000 emails to go about some marketing stuff, you'd want your user registration to go out first. Uh, it can use Redis as a queue, and it uh, has a nice builder interface as well. Um, so that, that's a good option if you use a traditional SMTP uh, mail server. There's also, um, if you use a, a third-party email service, such as Mailgun, SendGrid, or the like, there's some plugins out there as well to make that, uh, making that HTTP request for you easier. And again, using those email services is kind of nice if you have a marketing team who creates your emails and you just have to send it some parameters um, for tra transactional email. Email testing, so we have the green mail to, that's been around for quite a while that catches emails and allows you to do assertions on tests. But there's an, kind of an old but new to me one called Visor. It's actually an in-memory uh, SMTP server, SMTP server, yeah. And it's really easy to use. You set it up, in your, and I'll have an example here. Set it up in your test. Uh, let's see. 
So really, you just create this wiser object, and you set the port you want to use, and you start it, and that's all, all that you need to do. If there's an in-memory uh, listener on that, and you can just do assertions based on that um, object. So you can you know, see how many messages that you actually got, you know, uh, 10 emails when you sent 10 emails, or, or whatever you want. And it works with any email client uh, out there. And we do that size because it's a list. So that's kind of nice. If you just need simple unit tests for your emailing and you don't want to mock out and do a whole bunch of things, um, you can try out Wiser. And here's the Spring, er, Spring Starter email tools. So you can see we can build an email. And you can see, again, the builder syntax is from to subject encoding build. And there's multiple ways to send it. So if you want to send it right away, you can just call send on the email. Or if you want to schedule it, you can send the email with the highest priority. Or if you want to send it in the future, you can give it an offset date time of when you want to send it and schedule it for the future at normal priority. So again, if, you're doing, if you want to do more advanced emailing and scheduling, it's kind of a nice alternative to the mail plugin. And it all works, again, because we're built on top of, on top of Spring Boot. All right. So went over a lot of backend uh, plugins and a lot of backend stuff to make your building your app easier. So let's talk about some front front end examples. So Grails has come with the asset pipeline for quite a while now. Um, should be familiar with it. It's using it to process and bundle your JavaScript assets and do some dev time reloading as well. Uh, and actually, Davey just released uh, asset pipeline 3.0 with some nice new features in there, such as Babel support and CommonJS support. Um, it has its own plugin ecosystem as well. So uh, you can go to assetpipeline.com slash plugins if you want to add some functionality, such as handlebars, less SAS, or some other processing in there. Um, it's not only uh, usable for Grails. Any Gradle project can really use it, or use built-in support for Micronaut, Rap Hack, Spring Boot, et cetera. So it's not just something for Grails. So while Asset Pipeline processes your assets, it doesn't pull in third-party assets for you. So you're going to need something else to do that. You could always just download jQuery and throw it into your asset folder, but that's not really scalable as you start to add a lot more client dependencies. So there is a client dependencies Gradle plugin, which uh, you can store your resolve and store your assets in there. You can find it at that location there. It supports Yarn, NPM, and the, I think, now defunct Bower. And also, there's the Node NPM plugin, which allows you to run NPM tasks or Yarn tasks directly, which is kind of nice. If you have front end developers, you can use the exact same tools and exact same plugin resolution as them. Um, you can codify those tasks in your Gradle tasks, which is nice for CI and CD um, building. And yeah, for isolate it for your CI process. It'll automatically, if you don't have Node, ins node installed, it'll resolve download for the appropriate platform and always use the same version. So you're not using Node 10 on your laptop and Node 8 in your CI environment. So I'm actually going to show you my Sproutery project because I just implemented some stuff in there. So here's my build Gradle file. And really, this is all you have to do to configure it. So this is using uh, Vue and the Vue CLI to kind of um, uh, build a view application with uh, Webpack and integrate it into your Grails app. So there's not, a, there's not a, a static site and the Grails app. It's all kind of bundled together. So I store my um, view files in source main view. And I tell it if node is, not install, ins node is not installed, install it and use this version. So then you can run just a yarn task. And I find yarn to be more reliable than npm or bower. And there's some built-in tasks like yarn install. So I need to make sure all my dependencies are installed before I start my Webpack server. So let's just kind of run that so you can see what, how it'll work. So the Gradle task starts up. And there we go. You can see, actually, these are the native yarn um, output here. So it's looking at the log file, make, fetching and linking all my dependencies. And my Webpack server is starting here. And then there we go. Now I have my Webpack server running 
on that host. So again, it's just really nice to kind of isolate and contain all that stuff in one file and use the native tools for that the JavaScript community uses as well. You just have less um, issues going through that. Then the last thing to do is that when you actually build your war or jar, is that you want to copy those um, resources into your static resources file or directory. So just a really simple copy task to copy those from in the distribution and into your static public assets and link everything up. So yeah, I find that to work the best. Oh yeah, and then we have assets I was going to show you as well. So this is uh, just an example of the, the client dependencies plugin. It's very similar. I just very, made a very simple one. But I want to resolve these um, with Yarn, and I want to resolve Bootstrap and jQuery. And once I run that, it'll dump those assets into my vendor folder in my assets directory. So you can see I got all the JavaScript and CSS I need for Bootstrap and jQuery. So again, just an alternative to using that as well. All right. HTTP clients. So there's the Grails did come with HTTP Builder Helper, and Bobby and I updated that for a client. So it is available on Grails 3, but really only if you need it for backward compa compatibility. Um, recommend using a newer updated library. So HTTP Builder NG and HTTP Requests have come out, and they're really kind of a more modern way instead of the HTTP Builder or HTTP Client built into Groovy. You should check those out. All right. So serverless containers. So a lot of the, when I'm building and deploying apps, um, I spend a lot of time uh, working on the deployment scenarios and automating those. So one aspect is it's, it's easy to switch from Tomcat to Jetty or Netty or other um, serverless containers because, again, we're based on Spring Boot and they have starters for all those different containers. Of course, if you use servlet specific features and you switch to Jetty, some might not be available. So if you want a lower profile, lower memory footprint, or a faster um, profile, you can try out a couple of these. And yeah, let's look at a couple of those or what we can do with them. Oh, wait, Undertow is a kind of a newer, lower memory footprint servlet container. Oh, I didn't open that one as well. One second. Oh, I'm running low on time. This is actually a longer talk. Containers. So really, I just want to show how simple this was. Is You comment out the Spring Boot starter and put in the Undertow starter, and that's all you have to do. And now you ha you're running un with Undertow in your application. It's just that simple. So let's look at the Tomcat as well, because I wanted to show if you build your container, if you build your Grails application and ship it as a jar. Sometimes there's some things that aren't available with the properties um, to set up and customize Tomcat. So many of the times I find myself doing this: uh, containers, Tomcat. So. Again, Tomcat is just a Java application, right? So you can customize that. There's Spring Boot provides a configurable servlet container, and you can, you know, set up your SSL ports. I, I know sometimes if you have mutually uh, mutual SSL authentication, you need to do this yourself, or if you want to say use the native uh, Tomcat libraries on your operating system, you can configure that here as well. So again, it's just a way to add connectors and customize your Tomcat connector if there's things that aren't available from the Spring Boot properties um, to, for setup. And there's an example to that Tomcat native setup if you'd like. All right, so we only have five minutes left, so I'm going to try to cruise through the last couple things here. So external config, uh, when you deploy to different environments, you'll want different configuration, of course. The Grails 2, you could provide a list of locations. Um, Grails 3, uh, Soren actually has the external configuration plugin, which is almost exactly the same syntax. The external config 
plugin. Uh, also includes a couple handy YAML to Groovy or Groovy to YAML, so if you pick one or the other, you don't have to have both. And you can find it at external config. And again, we're based on Spring Boot, so all the Spring Boot um, location and property loaders work as well. One thing people sometimes don't realize, though, is that if you do server or server underscore port, it maps directly to server dot port in your configuration. So you can use that if you're in an environment which allows you to set environment variables. And you can find all those features at this link here. And lastly, the we have. Spring Boot starters. I've talked about many of them, and there's 80 plus in the repo right now, and there's ones built by the community. Um, many work out of the box with Grails, but some auto configuration makes some assumptions on some data sources or something, some beans to be configured. So that's one thing to look at carefully when you're evaluating starters is how they determine how they're auto configured. Um, yeah. All right. Um, Spring Boot endpoints, uh, when you're deploying your application, there's tons of endpoints available to you uh, to enable. So you can see here we have tons of uh, endpoints here to, you know, if you're using Flyway, it shows you what migrations have been applied, your properties. Some of these are sensitive and you have to enable them, or some of them are, are not, and you can see if they're sensitive, true or false. So again, we have all these because we're based on Spring Boot. Let's actually take a look at that quick. So I just took the, the I want to add some properties to my uh, in, info. And the way you do that and to enhance those actuator, is what they're called, endpoints, is you implement an info contributor. So I just made a silly Grails info contributor one where I could add some metadata about my Grails app to a custom, or to the uh, info endpoint. So you can see, I, can just, I just made a map with a couple of things. I'll make that a little bigger. And it has a builder object, which you can add details. So I added a Grails key with the Grails object in there as well. And after, of course, it's a bean, so you have to wire it up yourself. All, these, all this stuff will be on my slides as well, which are out there. And I'll tweet a link and post it in Slack. And I'm going to kind of skip, because we're running really short on time. Uh, I'll mention this quick too, that Grails testing, another reason I love Grails is because testing of the testing and testing framework. Um, but Spock can run JUnit uh, tests as well. So I mentioned we had, uh, you know, we're setting properties in multi-tenancy. Um, there's this awesome system rules, uh, Spock rule, that allows you to set up a whole bunch of, um, you know, your to mock out the system exit or mock out your input and output streams or system properties. So it's, you have to look outside the Grails kind of core and Spock core for other things out there that work with what you have. And the Spock up and running book is awesome. You should all get it and read it. I read, I think, all the way through the first day I got it. It was awesome. Uh, new testing framework we know about. Uh, there's a lot of options out there for seeding data. Drew, see, which was in a talk, I think, coming up or was just uh, build test data, which is awesome. And yes, since we're out of time, I'm just going to kind of skip through. Uh, just one last thing I get, I'll mention that sometimes plugins are overkill. Sometimes just using the Java library is good enough. So. Some examples, there used to be a Stripe plugin, but the Stripe jar is a really good API just for implementing it yourself. And if you want to, there's a Groovy Excel builder and Groovy CSV builder and readers. And just kind of use those jars as well. All right. So I'm just going to skip to the conclusion here. So kind of the good and the bad, the ugly. The good is now, you know, Grails 3 has everything you need there to, to build an app that you with all the features you need. Um, and sometimes you might have to look outside the Grails ecosystem into the uh, Groovy ecosystem, the you know asset pipeline ecosystem, the uh, Gradle ecosystem. Bad discoverability is still a little low. You need to know kind of know where to look to find these things. And hopefully this talk gave you some ideas of where to look and where to find some things. And the ugly sometimes 
I left years between releases. The mail plugin took a long time to go 2.0 final. Um, better change logs if you're a plugin maintainer. I, it's really, I really need to know what changed in your plugin so I can deploy it faster. And there's a lot of broken links, but every time I find one, I try to pull request and fix that. And I hope you guys do that too. So, thanks. And I know we're over on time, but if you have any questions or want to chat about any plugins or any questions on what I presented, just hit me up or talk now. <laughs>